It should have been a product manager. I'm not a product manager. I'm a sales manager. So uh, I'll try not to make a mess of the presentation. And uh, it's definitely, definitely going to be less technical than what you've just seen. All right. Uh, I've been, I started my career as a software developer, developing on C++ and, and Java, on SQL Server, on AIX. Probably some people here are too young to, uh, to know what AIX was. Um, and moved to sales about 20 years ago. So I've had also in between uh, technical roles. Uh, but currently, I manage the sales team of Canonical uh, in Europe. Right, so the talk today is about uh, uh, why bec to become a local CSP. By the way, I am French, uh, and I was asked to deliver this presentation in English. So I also try not to make a mess of, uh, of the English. Um, uh, so the seven reasons to become an ASP. Um, first, there is a demand. And I think you're going to see that the demand is increasing uh, or has been increasing, or at least the ask has been increasing in the past three months uh, following some, some market uh, movement. Um, because also you will find that in a lot of European countries, people are asking uh, for a sovereign cloud. Um, a lot of people are doing it, so why not you? Uh, and uh, what I would like to convey today to you is that it can be easier than, than what you think. Um, and you're very likely to have the infrastructure already. You have a brand. You don't know. So it's not my presentation. So every time I click, I think it's going to in the next slide. There's, there's something else. Uh, and we have some uh, business case to, uh, to show the, the economics. So the agenda today. Having set the scene, I'm going to talk about the hyperscalers and the challenge that they bring to you, um, or the advantages, but also the challenges. Um, I'm going to talk about OpenStack as a public cloud implementation. We are going to look at some cost. Uh, all the data I'm going to show you is available on our website. We have a, um, uh, a cost calculator that you can use. Uh, you can enter your VM, you can enter all sorts of uh, data and get an overall cost. Uh, I will present a couple of case studies, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about canonical OpenStack. So I'm going to try to keep it uh, generic and uh, not to make it look like a sales presentation, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how canonical sees things. Okay. Um, the hyperscalers and, and the benefits. Um, so the benefits or it uh, could be to you or to your uh, end customer. So obviously, I don't know the audience. I don't know if you are uh, an enterprise end customer or a, an organization providing uh, cloud services to end users. Um, this presentation is really targeting at CSPs, but um, to be honest, the, the, the economics works for, for, for both, um, for both um, uh, companies, whether you're a CSP or, or an end user. Um, so obviously you have the infinite el elasticity, um, you get uh, a high level of service uh, and you get a very large ecosystem. The hyperscalers have been working in the past 20 years to add API uh, all the time and I think uh, people who know OpenStack here in the room, you know that you won't have the same level of API to your end users than what the hyperscalers are offering. Um, that's the benefits. The challenge is, um, whether to you or, or to your end customers, again, if you're an enterprise or a CSP, one is the cost. Uh, it's an obvious one. Uh, the second one is the lock-in. Um, um, our recommendation at Canonical, when you use the public cloud, is to use two public cloud uh, clouds and to try to keep it generic and to use as less as possible the, the APIs, but it's, not, it's, it's very difficult. Um, so one is the lock-in. Um, um, the performance is, is another reason. Uh, I talked about the seven reasons, and we were talking about the sovereignty of your cloud. Uh, you can also achieve better performance if you run your own, your own cloud. Sovereignty, we talked about it. Um, the risk of monopolies and the risk of monocultures, it is back to the lock-in. It's exactly the same point. Um, again, at Canonical, we always recommend people to have one private cloud. Mm. And a lot of my customers have two private clouds, by the way, one on VMware, one on OpenStack, but to have also two public clouds to, to avoid this, this effect of, being on, of the locking. Right, the OpenStack, uh, not sure I need to give you the history of OpenStack here, 
No, okay. Um, what's interesting is Canonical was at OpenStack before it was OpenStack. Canonical had staff uh, based at uh, Rackspace um, and was working on the private cloud of Rackspace before the project, the, the OpenStack project. The reason why Canonical found itself in the OpenStack uh, initiatives by now close to 12 years ago was because Rackspace asked uh, Canonical to participate in the project. Okay. Fast forward 2024, so um, um, although we have our friends at VMware who've been telling the market for has been eight years at Canonical and they've been telling my customers for eight years, at least eight years, that OpenStack is dead, uh, OpenStack is definitely increasing. So this data is coming from, from, uh, from this community. But we've also seen it at Canonical. Uh, if I take the, uh, the numbers that we do in Europe uh, at Canonical, half our numbers comes from OpenStack projects. And these numbers have been increasing faster than the overall growth of Canonical. So our, our OpenStack projects are, are growing every year a lot. Now, we have also benefited from the exits of some players. Uh, back five years ago or six years ago, we had HP, HP Alien. We had other players which pulled out of the market, and that obviously helped us. And um, as of today, there's 95% there's, you know, of the time I end up being in, in a customer who's also talking to Red Hat, and that's mainly the two players in the market. Okay. All right. This is, again, the information from, uh, from, uh, from the OpenStack survey. Uh, about the public clouds in production in the world uh, based on OpenStack. Okay, so you're probably one of these dots somewhere on the map if you are uh, a CSP. Um, the benefits of OpenStack. I mean, again, are probably uh, pretty pre preaching to the to, to the to people who are um, to to agree with me here. There is the uh, absence of lock-in. Uh, I need to talk about, about my own uh, organization a little bit during this presentation. Um, the, um, the, the canonical philosophy, whether it's on the Linux, whether it's on the OpenStack, whether it's on the Kubernetes, whether it's on our Kubeflow AIML framework, whether it's on the applications that we support, is always to be open source and free license. Okay. So, um, in the past three months, the sales team, my sales team and myself have been inundated from questions from customers who are having issues with an existing supplier. And the question I get all the time is, what's going to happen if Canonical is bought by Microsoft next month, by Oracle, by another one? And I say, well, we, we have no license, no, our licenses are free. So although we might um, well, we might, um, I might not be there if this happens, but the organization might try to triple, quadruple your, 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 your contract, your support contract. You will have time to find a solution because you will not have to disinstall your clouds, your Linux, your Kubernetes, your AIML uh, platform. Okay. Uh, low latency, we see that a lot. A lot of the clouds you've seen on the map are outside the US, outside Europe. In countries where the hyperscalers data centers are a bit far and have high latency, um, we've had plenty of projects of SaaS vendors who uh, use the public cloud when they can find one with, with reasonable latency and install a local uh, OpenStack when needed. Um, data sovereignty for two reasons. One, the, the, the implementation can be in-country. They can also be implemented by an organization, by a company who uh, um, uh, belongs to that country with maybe no ties with, with uh, foreign countries. Um, brings a healthier market of smaller actors. Um, right, in infinite elasticity, um, um, that's obviously you need to buy more hardware. Um, but we're also talking here about having a multi uh, OpenStack cloud implementation. So we have plenty of large customers um, who have uh, three open stacks minimum per DCs and multiple DCs per countries all across the globe. Okay. Um, truly hybrid in the sense that if you are a CSP uh, and you offer uh, a cloud based in your own data center to a customer, 
if the customer decides to have a local equivalent in their own DCs, it's easy to do. And I have the perfect example of this. Um, we have uh, the Italian government, uh, public sector as, as, as customers, um, uh, implemented in uh, eight different open stacks in two different organizations, Telecom Italia uh, and, um, and DXE. And the uh, Tuscany, the region of Tuscany, decided that they did not want to rely on the global DCs. They wanted their, to have their data um, in, in the county, so the sovereignty at county level, um, and ask DXE to implement an exact copy of the OpenStack into their own DCs. And that was extremely easy to do for them, and they did it. Okay. Um, so that's what we call by truly hybrid. Uh, now, you could also do, and maybe some of you do, but I doubt because you are the OpenStack uh, uh, open day, but you could also do it without OpenStack. But our point is why should we uh, reinvent the wheel? You have a large community with developing OpenStack, so use, use OpenStack. Uh, you can um, innovate and uh, the limit is the sky really, because you can develop a new project should you wish to. Uh, there's a large community of knowledge sharing um, and the business case, and, and I'll insist on this, the business case is very valid. Right, so some cost analysis. All the data you're going to see comes from our website. Uh, go on uh, ubuntu.com uh, slash, uh, slash OpenStack somehow and you will get access to, to this data. Well, this one is very gen generic. Um, so obviously, if you use an hyperscaler, uh, your end customer will pay per VM, and as the VM grows and as the, the network transfer grows, the, the, the cost is, is growing. If it's in your own cloud, um, and the cost is fixed. Now, I challenged this, this graph when I saw it, uh, when the product manager sent it to me, and I said, well, if you need more capacity, you need more hardware, so your cost is going up as well. And he said, yes, of course. But what we're trying to explain here is that should you have uh, defined the cost at the beginning for a set number of hardware, the cost will stay flat for the rest of the, uh, the project. Um, um, and, and, um, and, and, and this is really where the profit margin sits in the second part of the quadrant here. Uh, once these two lines crosses, uh, you are going to make money by selling a project to, uh, to, a CS, to an end customer. Or if you're an end customer, you will also make money. Um, a long time ago, people explained to me that it's like renting or, or buying. If you stay a long time at the same place, you're probably better to buy a house than to rent a house. All right. Uh, so we've got um, three scenarios, I believe. Uh, one where, obviously, you're better off staying with your hyperscaler. Um, and we see that a lot at Canonical, by the way. We see a lot of software vendors. We see a lot of enterprise who start with a project, startups, and they start in the public cloud. And they contact us when the cost starts to get uh, out of control and wants to run it in their own, their own cloud. And, and we see that a lot. Um, that's where it gets a bit more. So here we had what was the first one, an internal CRM system running on uh, um, a very few VMs or uh, 24 vCPUs. I'm sorry, I can't. To see you, I need to wear my glasses to read my screen. I need to take them off. So it's going to be an interesting exercise. Um, right, where it gets a bit more interesting here, we have an online banking system and the, uh, the number of CPUs is obviously uh, going up uh, along the, uh, the year. And by year one, uh, the end customer uh, has a better uh, interest to move to, uh, to, to, to its own data center on uh, cloud. Now, the data I'm showing you for the implementation of OpenStack is based on canonical cost. This cost, or if you, because if you go on the, the TCO calculator of, cal of canonical, this is what you get. The cost there are uh, based on an installation by Canonical with a support contract 24 by 7 by Canonical. Okay, so um, some of you are probably doing uh, even even cheaper than this. Okay, and uh, a video streaming uh, where it doesn't make it makes no sense, and we probably all have the same one in in mind, the one which uh, all running Ubuntu and decided to go back into uh, their own DCs uh, about five years ago. Um, where it doesn't make sense to run on the public cloud. Now, the public cloud um, um, 
Uh, people here are going to tell us, oh, yeah, but you get discount, you get commit, you get and so on and so on and so on. But we all know that the economics are in favor of uh, an open stack private cloud uh, for very large numbers. Again, I, I'll invite you to go uh, on our website and look at all this. Uh, you can play with the, with, with, the, with the TCO. You can also, and I'm sure I'm talking to people who are not interested in this, but we also have at Canonical a managed service for OpenStack. I'm saying that because you are OpenStack people. Um, but it's interesting as well, because if Canonical can do it and make, obviously, a margin on managing the OpenStack of an end customer, right? You can also do it for cheaper than that. So that gives you an idea of what cost you can achieve if you have no idea what the labor cost would be of operating your own cloud. Right, some case studies. Um, um, uh, Nayatel, uh, that's, that's a, a public cloud in Pakistan. Um, they wanted, for obvious reasons, not to rely on the hyperscale of and uh, contacted, contracted Canonical for a full installation, and they are running multiple DCs uh, in the country and provide public services in the region. Uh, the case study is available on our website, um, and um, you probably can also organize a call with the end customer, should you wish for uh, wish to. And Fermus, Fermus is a very interesting one. It's one of these new uh, uh, net zero cloud. It's, uh, it's uh, powered by hydroelectrics. Uh, it's cooled by uh, water as well. Um, and it's an HPC cloud. The company started uh, with no customers by uh, uh, doing cryptocurrency, okay, mining basically, to finance the cloud at the beginning, to finance the hardware, and started to sign up customers. Um, and these people contacted us. Uh, the day they contacted us, the company was two people in stealth mode um, with absolutely uh, just the, the, the investment from the investors, basically. And this is a cloud which has been in production now for two and a half years. Again, the case study is available on the website. Um, if you are a, a end customer uh, and you are uh, looking for a data sovereignty example, you will find two on the website which are quite recent in the past six months. The United Nations, they decided to contract Canonical to install the cloud um, um, in the world, worldwide. Um, uh, the main reason is data sovereignty. Okay, it was not the cost, it was not um, uh, the performance, it was data sovereignty. Um, um, and and uh, the, the United Nations had to prove that they were not attached to any country, basically, um, technically, politically, commercially, um, and decided to contract Canonical. So we installed the, the first few clouds, and they are now in production with more to come. Um, so that's United Nations, and just type United Nations Ubuntu, you'll find the case study on the website. And one which was just released, I believe, two days ago is the European Space Agency, which has also contracted Canonical for uh, multiple clouds, multiple uh, Kubernetes, multiple applications. Um, um, we are doing also the installation and support on uh, Kafka and Postgres for them. Uh, again, all based on data sovereignty. Um, a little bit of, uh, that's what I do, I sell. So a little bit of hard sell on, on Canonical. Um, um, why are people going with our cloud? Now, if, if I bore you, you're, I'm at, you know, just, just leave the room or, or tell me and we'll stop and we'll talk about something else. Um, our clouds are fully automated. I mentioned um, that we do manage service, okay? The reason why we can service 150 customers, mainly remotely, some of our customers are, uh, have people on site. Um, um, people who live in the UK, when you place a call, on the BT, or when you visit the UK and you roam on the BT network, uh, all those calls are, are handled by uh, OpenStack, uh, Canonical OpenStack, and we have people on site um, and helping them with the day operation of the, um, I can't remember how many clouds, how many OpenStack, there's 70 or 80 OpenStack they are running, plus Kubernetes, but, but um, this is all, all happening uh, by, managed by Canonical. Um, but we also do a lot of management uh, remotely. Uh, that's the case of the European uh, Space Agency. That's the case of the United Nations. Uh, and I think we've been really good at promoting OpenStack 
through that service because a lot of enterprise were scared to move to OpenStack um, because they find it really hard to find the skills. Um, one of my customers told me one day, and I thought it was, it was so good. We were having a um, lunch in the restaurant next to their office. And they said, you know what my problem is? I said, no. They said, um, there's about 50 people here. If I stand up and I ask who knows VMware, I'll get 15 people. If we ask OpenStack, there'll be no one. Um, uh, so that, that's the challenge that we have seen on the market. So this is why Canonical launched more than 10 years ago now, the, the, the managed service for, for OpenStack. So it's been very, very, very good at promoting OpenStack in the sense that I can go to a customer and I say, look, you want OpenStack, it's a given. Uh, you don't know how to operate it, you failed. I mean, I've had plenty of customers who did a, a who tried and said it's too complicated and came to us and, and we helped them. Um, we'll install it, we we'll take the risk, you pay when it's installed and we operate it um, uh, for 12 months, for 24 months and we train you. And I think we've been, no, it's not I think, I know we've been very successful at promoting OpenStack through that service. Um, and, and we do it remotely to so many different customers because our clouds are more automated than others, okay? Um, cost effective, we are not always the cheapest, but we are at 90% the cheapest. We happen to lose on price against VMware, believe it or not, uh, when, when, when they want to win. Um, uh, Ali per performant in the sense that we, we support uh, GPU and, and DPU, and we are one of the first uh, open stacks to support DPU, I believe. Um, a lot of a lot of people are on Ubuntu, so we are, we are lucky that it's very rare that I get a customer and they give me a list of hardware and we don't support it, very, very rare. Uh, enterprise grade in the sense that should you need 24 by seven support, we can do it. Um, um, now, this is an important one. We do two types of engagement on OpenStack. You want us to install the OpenStack, you want us to manage the OpenStack, we can do that. But should you have an OpenStack running on Ubuntu, um, running from maybe the cloud archive and your organization for a particular project feels that they need a 24 by seven support, that's something we can do as well, okay? It has to be on Ubuntu, running from the cloud archive. It can be installed with, uh, on call Ansible, on Anci with Ansible. It doesn't have to be uh, the fully automated cloud by Canonical. We can do that as well. And we have done it for some of our uh, customers who came to us and um, felt that they needed a 24 by seven support. Most of the time, it's the management who's a little bit worried to have something in production with no support of an editor. Um, so how does it work, the fully automated OpenStack? It's using uh, two tools, mass metal as a service. This is the bare metal provisioning that most of, um, I assume you, you, you know. And Juju is less known, but it's, a, um, it's an event-driven, object-oriented uh, framework to install and operate applications. You're going to see a lot of noise on the next generation OpenStack from Canonical. This Mass and Juju are going to be used um, uh, more, but also encapsulated into another layer of automation on top. Um, so um, we, are, we are talking about an OpenStack with very little, um, um, uh, with almost zero operation in the next two years. Um, have a look on our website. It's coming. The product is going to be has been released, but is not complete. It's not in par in features with with the current ones that we have. But by the end of the year, we will start when we do a commercial engagement and our teams install the OpenStack. We will start using this new this new OpenStack. Uh, Internal code name in Sun, Sunbeam, and the external name is MicroStack, and that might change because we are having customers who complain that MicroStack sounds like it's running on three nodes and we have customers with thousands of nodes. So the name might change. Um, the advantage to move to a more automated OpenStack is to reduce the cost of operations, which really is budget for R&D, okay? Uh, our customers, let me stop the sound on this laptop. Our customers do not do uh, an OpenStack to have an OpenStack, they do an OpenStack to run workloads. They run workloads because they want to do things with them. So we release the budget to have more uh, budget for the workloads. 
I talked about the, the performance we do DPU, CPU, GPU. Uh, and if you want more information, we can, um, we can provide that to you. And as I said, very, very fortunate at Canonical that I, I hardly go in. You know, we, we always have the hardware supported on Ubuntu. So that's been, uh, that's been very, very useful. Our OpenStack are released. Uh, we follow the cadence of OpenStack. Um, we tend to support the new OpenStack within a month. Um, and we support uh, every two years a version for five years with an extension at 10 years. Okay, So an OpenStack can now be installed and supported for 10 years, the same OpenStack. Uh, the reason it's five years and five years is because the, the, second, tra the second part of five years is more expensive than the first five. So that's, that's something to know. Um, um, but we have plenty of customers running now on, on all the OpenStack. Um, we all would like customers to upgrade the OpenStack, but we know it it's, can be quite difficult, and some of them prefer to leave it as it is. Uh, I have customers are telling me, my OpenStack is stable, it's running, I'm not touching it. Uh, so they keep, they keep uh, support, um, uh, renewing the contract on, on the existing OpenStack. Um, the, you know the tooling I was talking about? The mask, the juju, the, the layer above, this is, this is all, when we release an open stack, we release all the, the code to, to do that upgrade, okay? It's still not, uh, you will see some tweets about people who use this tooling and do upgrades very easily, but it's still something to, to do with care. We have packages, so we help customers to do the upgrade from time to time. We um, have also uh, launched about 18 months ago a new service. So our managed service division has a lot of experience of operating OpenStack. And um, a lot of the customers who were on phone support 24 by 7, not managed service, ask us for assistance from time to time on upgrading, on training, on replatforming. And so we have launched this service recently where we can do that. Um, and we are doing it for a large uh, manufacturer in, in Germany right now, where we are moving the open stacks installed by us, but only supported 24 by seven to a semi-managed service during the upgrade. So should something go wrong, they have the assurance that we can um, investigate very quickly. I should have mentioned whether it's support of managed service, uh, we have people 24 by seven through the three regions. Um, the, the, the support group is, is 100 plus people across uh, Americas, so Europe, and, and Asia Pacific. All right, so that's the end of the. Pro so this time I'm not going to pretend that is the last slide, and it's not. Uh, here we are. There is demand. You will see demand. You will see more demand for, for OpenStack. I think uh, it was mentioned. I was not here this morning, but it was mentioned in the keynote, and, and we all know why. Uh, sovereignty is, is one that your organization is going to ask you or your customer, your customers. Uh, some of them are doing it, that, that's for sure. It's easier than you think uh, if you use our tooling. Uh, you might have the infrastructure, I don't know that. You probably have a brand and uh, we have the business case for you that we, we can share with you. Thank you. And you'll be pleased to hear that I gave you 15 minutes more for your break. Any questions? No? You want to have a break?